Okay, brilliant. All right. So, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, Zoom meeting on the 6th of June, 2019. And uh, today we're going to be discussing the Mutable Cross. Um, I really, I, I really feel inspired to to share this uh, information today, or at least uh, you know convey some of my ideas around what I see the in the Mutable Cross. There are um, some really real reasons as to why I think it's relevant for us right now, uh, considering that the, the current transits that we're dealing with, with uh, Jupiter and Sagittarius retrograde, um, we've got Neptune and Pisces, which are both uh, mutable energies, and we've just recently had a new moon take place for us in uh, Gemini. And of course, they were actually squaring, right? And, and I think the sun is actually squaring Gemini, sorry, not Gemini, uh, Neptune, and it's going to be opposing uh, Jupiter in a full opposition within the next like two or three days, maybe even more. But so that, that I felt like it was a really great way for us to explore this uh, connection of um, archetypes and what they really represent to us. And on some level, actually give us an opportunity to contemplate the, the nature of what is occurring for us through transits. And obviously this won't be, forever so you know for most of us this will be relevant right now um, to contemplate the nature of these energies and if you've got them in your own personal charts and, and how that sort of manifests and works for you and what that might mean for you in terms of your soul's evolution and I think that there are a lot of people in my own personal practice that I've seen come through where they're trying to reconcile this um, profound and I think we all are, and this is where I'm going to go into, but we all are on some level trying to reconcile this, this, this split between uh, the meaning of our existence and um, the purpose of what that meaning can represent or the lack thereof. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to adjust the, the screen over here because there, okay, that makes better. Okay, so so there's there's quite a lot to talk about, and I've seen it I've seen it in in my practice with with clients that this is something that seems to be very uh, clear. And I think one of the reasons why you would come to have an astrology reading or explore your chart is that you are searching for something. And you know, Sagittarius is an archetype um, as it interconnects with all of the other twelve signs or eight, eleven. Um, there is as a totality, it, 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 it wants us to, um, as human beings search for that meaning. Okay. And so it's not a coincidence that we're sitting here today talking about astrology and exploring it and finding the, 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 the information that's available in the myriad of, of people that we listen to and digest their information from and their knowledge. And, you know, if it wasn't for the connection between Sagittarius and Gemini, the conceptualization of another person's um, vision and ideals uh, wouldn't be able to take place. So, and the ideal part would be linked with the Pisces archetype. And as I said before, Gemini, Sagittarius and Neptune or Pisces are all connected at the moment with this new moon that took place. And so, it's really something interesting to contemplate around how we give meaning to things in life and how we uh, validate that meaning in our lives through the type of philosophy or um, purpose that we see in it and, and the communication, the language that we develop around that. And, and that in itself, I think, is a handful and a lot of time and attention that we can actually sort of, and in a very uh, interesting way because I'll talk about it a bit later in today's conversation devotion yeah, to, to devote the time to really inquire into what I'm sharing right now um, and something else that was that's been on my radar uh, somebody asked me a question a while back around what was the significance of um, you know Uranus at the moment in Taurus opposing um, the natal Plutos of those that are born where Pluto is sitting like for myself, 29 degrees, uh, one degree Scorpio, two degree Scorpio, three degree Scorpio, four degree Scorpio. Now this time period. And I had an intuitive hit of a sense and that 
sort of sent me on a mission to investigate. And again, this is kind of the, the, the nature of meaning, Sagittarius, exploration based on a question, Gemini. And immediately you can begin to see the architecture of um, Gemini as an archetype of, of questioning, of curiosity, of searching. Um, and, and Sagittarius about the exploration of what may exist when we seek. So, um, so I began to explore all this and what I actually discovered and what you will 90% of the time always find occur when a question gets posed to you that you seek to in explore or investigate is that what you find is not what you thought you would find. Okay. And, um, so that's brings me back to, again, why this conversation today I think is, is important and why could it be valuable to you is that the Pluto and Virgo generation and the relationship that you have to the Pluto and Sagittarius is, notice Virgo, mutable sign, Pluto, Sagittarius, Sagittarius, mutable sign. Um, there, there's a very profound relationship between you two at the moment in terms of the current global cycles, you know, where we are today. And um, so what I, what I found was something really profound. And so, again, today's conversation is my attempt to uh, bring to light the myriad of ways that this mutable cross actually shows up in our human psychology and what we actually gain from incarnating the archetypes into our consciousness that then becomes a manifestation of our reality and has, as we interact with that and how that interaction um, uh, alters our psychological state and provides us with awareness. Okay. So before I do that, I just want to fix my camera because it seems to blur in and out and uh, just fix that over there. Okay, perfect. All right. So I'm going to switch to some slides and um, let's see what this journey is like for us today. So share the screen. Let me know if everybody can see the screen. Yes, that's yes. cool. Yes. Okay. Brilliant, brilliant. All right. So there's the move. Okay. All right. So mutable cross. Um, and for any of you that want to know about my work, um, that's my website over there. And um, you'll find a lot of other stuff, material that's been created, you know, articles and stuff that uh, could be helpful in terms of learning about evolutionary astrology um, outside this, this conversation today. Okay. Um, we'll start with this beautiful axiom of as above, so below. Um, I think that it is a very profound piece of um, knowledge and awareness to have and insight to have when working with the natural zodiac and working with uh, life itself. Um, it's, it's not something that you need a belief system. This is something that Jeffrey Wolfgang used to talk about in his teachings. You, a belief system. You don't need a belief system when observing the nature of reality in nature. So you can see that there is this reflection of a quality um, that is very masculine and very feminine water, you know, reflective and masculine, the light. And so these polarities exist within our reality. And so naturally speaking, they're going to exist within the context and the framework of our um, exploration of archetypal um, expression in the zodiac and in astrology, right? And we know this, but it's always very healthy to kind of just start off with really, you know, putting that that point across. You know, this is not a belief that we have. It's we're all looking at the same thing. We can all see the observable reality the same way, and so. In that sense, this is a very profound way to understand Gemini, uh, sorry, uh, Sagittarius. You know, uh, multiple people looking at the same thing, we can agreeably accept that that is a, 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 a duality within reality as above, so below axiom. And so it's a collective truth that we share, right? Sagittarius, right? Okay. So the mutable uh, signs consist of the archetypes, Pisces, water, uh, Gemini, uh, air, and let me just highlight it for you over there. Water, air, Gemini, Virgo is earth, and Sagittarius is fire. 
And those modalities are really interesting because um, you notice that, of course, we have all of the four within that um, square. And so they all bring to the mutable cross uh, qualities that are not of the same. So Virgo is not like fire. And uh, naturally speaking, these archetypes in the natural zodiac, which I'll show you, they square each other. So they form a combination of 90 degree and 180 degree angles to each other. Virgo is 180 degrees of Pisces. Gemini is 180 degrees of Gemini. Uh, Sagittarius, pardon me, and Gemini. I'm going to get those mixed up a couple of times today, so sorry for that. Um, and then when we have Pisces, it naturally squares Sagittarius. Pisces naturally squares um, Gemini. Gemini naturally squares Virgo. And Virgo naturally squares Sagittarius. All right, square is the 90 degree angle and 180 degree is the opposition that sits between the two. And so the opposition reflects the nature of the polarities that we were talking about earlier in the previous um, picture, okay? And of course the squares, Pisces and uh, Gemini, right? Pisces is water, Gemini is air. Those modalities don't necessarily mix well together. Uh, fire and earth, they don't really mix well together. And so you can see that there's a dynamic tension. There's a dynamic tension between the archetype of Gemini and, um, and uh, Virgo. There's a dynamic tension between the archetype of Gemini and Pisces, right? And one of the ways that you can actually objectify this is, um, have you ever seen uh, a, well, ironically, this is actually the complete opposite. I was going to say, if you've ever seen water in the, in the, in the air, but there is, there's water in the air because it's a cloud. Um, there, there was, there was something that I was going to share about that, but it's eluded me. So I'll leave that at the end, but you get the idea of the dynamic tension that exists. Okay. So mutable signs know how to go with the flow. And, um, we're talking about uh, the nature of change, you know, mutable signs, Pisces, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius. We're talking about the night, the, the dynamic of change and expansion of growth. Okay. And so, it's very fluid. It's interchangeable. That's why um, water is very fluid like that. Air of Gemini, it moves and scattered. You know, that's how you would have said it. The Virgo it can be very par paralytic and very stuck in, in, in the process and paralyzed. And it's, you know, very much in the process of too many details. You can get into that. And then, of course, with, with Sagittarius, it's essentially you can, with wind, fire can move pretty far. So it goes a lot. So they're uh, adaptable and flexible, and they can change their form and expression to whatever situation requires. Absolutely, you know, um, I'm I'm an I'm a, uh, a fixed sign with my Scorpio, and this energy is very different to Virgo. It's very different to Sagittarius. My Moon is in Gemini, so I can feel that dynamic tension between my Moon being very flexible and interchangeable, and then my Sun sign really, really wanting to be fixed in something and it takes a bit of time for me to adjust. And so I can really, really relate to the mutability, uh, flow and change and rapid change, growth and expansion. Okay. So I like this because it, 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 it introduces the depth of the conversation today. Okay. And it's really interesting because the way that I'm gonna, the way that, that this has been expressed. By the way, this is written by uh, a person called uh, Thomas Moore uh, from the book called *The Care of the Soul*, and um, it's a fantastic book. I highly encourage uh, any of you to, 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 um, you know, take a read or um, look into it. It's it's actually really phenomenal. It's influenced a lot of of my personal work. So faith is a gift of spirit that allows the soul to remain attached to its own. Um, unfolding. I like that so much. You know, the faith is a gift of spirit, spirit being Pisces, faith being Sagittarius. And I'll explain why those are the way that they are. Allows the soul to remain attached to its own unfolding. One of the, the things that's really poetic about the nature of meaning and the nature of why we search for meaning in our lives is because of this uh, intimate connection between. Um, Pisces and Taurus 
And in the next uh, Zoom meeting, I'm actually going to do the, the water sign and the, the um, earth sign together to show the nature of transformation and spiritual awakening. And, um, you know, Sagittarius squares Pisces. And so we, we create faith from those, from that to those two um, angles or that, that angle, the tension over there, we're always in that constant crisis of, of trying to find meaning through the illusion or through this, this reality. And, and so faith gives us this or faith as it were, uh, is a gift of spirit that allows the soul or allows the soul to remain attached to its own unfolding. And, and the, the earth element, which is not in the mutable cross, the Taurus archetype, it connects to Pisces. It makes a sextile. And so it indicates to us that there is this um, relationship between spirit and matter. And the soul incarnates itself, as we know, through the flesh to experience itself and so the body becomes a vehicle for the transformation and faith gives us the opportunity to bind the spirit to the physical otherwise it would be this connection and this is one of the reasons why the pluto and virgos really are only now in my opinion and i mean this in the most sincerest and and authentic and honest way even though um and i i question i'm asking for interaction with me only now will you become aware of the purpose of your existence And I'll elaborate on why that is the case. It has a lot to do with your Neptune and Scorpio. So, um, so the unfolding of this, of the spirit faith kind of allows that to remain attached when faith is soulful. It is always planted in the soil of wonder and questioning. And I like that because now all of a sudden we've gone from this kind of Sagittarius Pisces archetype to something where it's now earth and, and it's, it's Taurus, sorry, not Taurus is the binding agent but then wonder and questioning, right? So Virgo in the sense, in the sense is the questioning part, and the wonder is the archetype of, of uh, Gemini here. And, and Je- Sagittarius can absolutely be connected to wonder because again, um, you know, you're wondering to, to, as, as you're on your exploration, as you navigate through this world, um, as you navigate the, the nature of what is the relationship that you have with yourself and your partner and, if you're a parent and what is the relationship and what are your kids teaching you and what do friends teach you and why do you attract those people into your life and what is the purpose of the relationship between yourself and your, your parents and why is there emotional unresolved stuff there and what is the purpose of that? And so wondering and questioning is a very, is a very interesting way of understanding the kind of earthliness that the soul wants to embed itself in and you can see this beautiful connection between meaning and faith and spirit, spirit being Pisces and faith being Sagittarius and, you know, Gemini being the wandering part, the curiosity part, and then the sharpening the questions, getting this, the, the questions, like really, really being specific about and analyzing it and, and not analyzing it from a mental plane of, you know, in depth kind of like, cause you can become, um, paralyzed in your mental process when you're searching. And again, one of the reasons why the Pluto and Virgos um, are here as a collective and then, you know, in, individually, you can become paralyzed in that questioning. But this questioning is more about the observation of your interaction with your reality and how that interaction is revealing to you the purpose of the experience that was an act that was started off by wandering. And then it, it kind of um, must be cultivated with a faith and that faith then guides you to spirits. And so as we start off with faith as a gift of spirits, what we're actually doing is we're moving through this beautiful axis between, um, and I'll actually do this right now because I put it in, in a specific order here, the mutable cross. Okay. So here's, here's the, the, the faith part. I'll just draw it like that. There's the faith part. Actually, I'll just do this instead. Okay, so here's the faith part and here's the spirit part and here's the wondering and and the questioning, okay? That's the mutable cross, those signs there. Uh, Actually, I'm going to erase this and do this instead. Okay, there's the oppositions between the two. Okay, and then there you can see how I'm forming the crosses with the 90 degree angles. Okay. All right. 
So everybody's following me a little bit over here. So this, this the, what I wanted to share in the, in the previous, as you put it all together, is that it all interfaces with each other. There is no separation between the two. It's not like one doesn't come before the other. And just like with the opening image that I showed with the mutable cross and the, 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 the purpose of revealing the axiom of as above, so below. So the same thing gets projected on here. The same thing gets applied here. And when you, when you synthesize it like that, you can see how the mutable cross and exploring the field of perception is what actually brings us into, and again, no accident here in terms of choice of picturing, it brings us into the center of our being through the vision. It's like the keyhole that we use that allows us to, um, in a sense, get rid of the noise around us and for us to have that vision that then allows us to nourish the necessity for continuously binding and almost sowing and, um, and nurturing the relationship between spirits and flesh, okay? Bond between the two and the perception and the necessary um, need for that perception. So it's this beautiful uh, thing that brings us into alignment. And, you know, one of the things that I love to, to share about the mutable cross is that when you, when you take a look at this tree and there, you know, there can be more clear examples, but I see this is the fixed cross. It's like it's consistent pattern of stability. Okay. But once we start to kind of get to this point over here, mutation or mutability exists here. Right, so Gemini and Virgo and Sagittarius says, well, what happens if we explore that direction? What happens if we explore that direction? Then eventually it becomes like that. And so the branches of the tree expand like this, and that's what happens with, with um, the process of wandering and questioning. Wandering and questioning says, let's explore that. Let's open ourselves up to that experience. And as we open up to that experience, we, we have a direct experience of it. We have a, a, a perception of it. And that, that perception, when we process and integrate it into ourselves, when we digest it, it becomes a, um, a, 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 an aspect of reality or an aspect of the divine, if you want to label it like that, in that way. Um, so we explore and, and broaden our horizons. And ultimately, that's what it's about. That's the tethering. That's the connection, again, with the soul. It's like the soul is broadening its, its landscape and its horizons. And the mutable energy brings us into the capacity to explore that at the, at the most deepest level. So education um, would be something that goes under mutable signs because you know, Sagittarius is like a higher truth. You know, what is the deeper meaning in it? So you, you start with the curiosity and astrology to know something, and then you eventually decide uh, through the multiple YouTube videos that you've watched that this is the astrologer or the book that you've, the millions of books that you've read. And then, you realize, okay, that's the person you want to study with. And then you make that commitment, Sagittarius, after analyzing the specificness of which person meets your, your needs, as it were, with, with Virgo. And then you explore that and you learn that and you have a direct experience. And then you have this wisdom in you that's abstract and nonlinear and it's existing in a, in a way that can't be touched. And so this is this Pisces essence, you know, and you, you keep exploring until eventually you just expand and bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, the mutable cross really, really opens us up to exploring the nature of, of life in a, in a way that's, that's pretty decent. So um, I think somebody had a question. Um, okay. All right. So can everybody see the pointer on the screen, by the way? Just, just let me know if you can. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, so now that you have an imprinting of uh, the mutable cross and you can see the Gemini Sagittarius function, you, you understand the squares of there, we're going to move over to um, a more kind of like right brain uh, process. So that's okay. So this is actually the core of this conversation for me today. Um, this is really what brought about the, the, the desire to, to talk about this. And it, and it ties in with the, the slide about faith and spirits and the connection and the sowing of it. So why, why do we look for meaning in our lives? You know, what, what, is the, what is the driving point in hu human beings' search for meaning? And what then, and then from that place, 
I, I suppose you, we begin to then manifest the, the, the diversity of fractals in which meaning can exist for us. And that's another way to actually see the expansion of the mutable energy working, those archetypes working, because they're all about growing. Remember, it was flowing, it was adaptation. If you saw a tree and you looked at all that tree that I was showing you earlier, if flow and adaptability wasn't part of the mutable cross, then you would see a branch just go like that and it would just go up straight like this, but they don't. Trees don't look like that. You can see that they they move into different ways and it's it's not just static. And so naturally speaking, when we individually incarnate into this plane and we awaken to a, a, a realization about the nature of this reality, one of the reasons why we begin to search for meaning is that We've got to try to, we try to make sense of the vastness that is this place. So I remember in, in the school with Jeffrey, he talked about um, Sagittarius being the archetype that uh, is like, it's, it's, a, it's an umbrella, okay? It's a, it's a cosmology and it's an umbrella and it's a manifestation of all of the pieces of information that you've gathered, Gemini, all over the place. And it becomes an overarching umbrella that allows you to have a natural orientation towards life. Okay. And the, the necessity for that, and again, why do we look for meaning is that if you didn't have that buffer between your, your ego self, and what exists beyond the most immediate environment, I think you would be pretty freaked out. It would be really, really, really difficult to, to navigate yourself. To, I think even in and of itself, exists in a way where anything could be processed. I think that it is a necessity. And so I think by, natural, by, by a natural default, the, the, the formation of this cosmology uh, occurs because of this intense interface between your subjective sense of reality and the context and the vastness of what exists from that point of your own subjective reality and where objective reality meets. Okay, so this is why I chose this picture because the, 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 the imagery over here of everybody standing on the edge is like the ego. And I've, and I've shared about this in, in different kinds of conversations um, that there's always this, uh, this, this, this barrier between what we feel comfortable with, which is where people are standing on. And, you, and I want you to connect to the feeling of what that must be like to stand at the edge of this enormous canyon Okay, that you can clearly see not only was manifested through like huge geographical uh, movements that are so incredibly vast and enormous in its magnitude that to conceptualize the experience of itself is just far too like deep to comprehend. It's just it's just mind blowing. What would have occurred? What created such intense cavern? Like you know the 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 the, the movements the the um, you know the nature of of what that looks like. The word is missing me at the moment. And here we are. We're fascinated by it, and we're fascinated by this relationship between what is in the unknown and where we can feel safe. Right. And that interface, I think, is something that that at a at a, a very small level um, becomes a necessity for religion okay for ideologies for belief systems that are um sort of manifestations of collective ideas that are validated through um a, a, a sort of i don't know validation of of that truth or that ideology so so kind of like a resonance right but at, at the very simplest level that that connection between those people standing on the edge over there and feeling the, 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 that space of the enormity of what exists outside your life, 
and where you are and how you feel safe, okay? It manifests itself as religion. And so meaning becomes a uh, manifestation or the search for meaning or the, 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 the necessity for meaning in our lives at that consensus level manifests itself through security and through survival and then becomes an, an overarching uh, belief system. Okay, and then that governs people to navigate themselves. And why are they being navigated? Why are we being navigated by our beliefs? Because of exactly that relationship. Because it is man's search for meaning. Um, another picture that I wanted to use was a man standing on, um, on like the rocks again, and he was sort of very small, or a person, should I say, and he's looking into the galaxy and he experiences the rift, the natural rift that exists within our uh, um, night sky, right? The dark rift. And that is a very beautiful picture to also imagine because it, it speaks to this, again, this natural rift that takes place between our subjective sense of self and what we consider reality to be and the objective reality and the enormity of it and and how to how to reconcile that like how to actually reconcile what the meaning of our existence is about okay um and so this again i want you to gr like really really grasp the fact that it's this interface between such enormity and our little subjective self interfacing with it and trying to digest that and it can be very profound. I was listening to, to somebody talk about this in a, in a different way, and so I'm going to use a couple of their terminology. Um, but think of yourself like psychologically, okay? When you interact with something that's new, right? The unknown in front of you doesn't have, it doesn't have a map. You don't have a map with it in your, in your psychology. And so naturally speaking, when you interact with that, you're going to feel afraid. You're going to feel uncertain. You're going to feel um, on some level uh, anxiety because your psychology, your psychological map of your reality has not explored it to know what is there. And so therefore it becomes very hidden. It becomes um, un exactly that, uncertain. It's dark. So we as human beings are in a constant state of exploring a little bit of uncertainty and unknowingness and then coming back and digesting it and then working out again. And so that's how we kind of expand our borders of, of exploration and comfortability. So, you know, like with Sagittarius as an example and Virgo and Gemini and Pisces, that whole entire thing, it's we're in a constant dance between the curiosity and the wonder and then the kind of existential crisis that we might feel as we interact with that, that uncertainty, what's, what's that about? You know, like you decide that you want to go and travel, um, you know, India, for instance, you've never been there before. Um, you don't know what it's like. And so you naturally project a kind of reality onto that Pisces that is not a, a, an actual direct experience of reality, J Jupiter, pardon me, Sagittarius and, and Virgo but your curiosity leads you to it, right? The wonder parts, the Gemini function. And so there's that dynamic square between Gemini and um, Pisces where curiosity leads us out of the unknowing Pisces into exploring what is there in reality, Virgo. And the exploration of that allows us to map the reality so that then when we've mapped that reality and we've explored it, we can then assimilate it back into the Pisces archetype. And so therefore it becomes awareness. And so it's this natural interplay between, or this constant interplay between the unknowingness and the darkness and then the light. And this is where the whole entire kind of cosmology of dark and light comes from on one level, because again, we're exploring the unknown. Another way to see this is, uh, uh, and I think it's a really, really cool way to actually understand it a lot, is that imagine, would you choose to swim in a swimming pool, like a, a public swimming pool, for instance, where there are very clear lines at the bottom of the pool. You can see there's a, there's a lifeguard and, you know, um, there's like these uh, rows of, of rope that, that a lot like a line next to you. So if you, you know, felt that you were getting tired, you could always use them and then kind of navigate your way to the end. Or would you feel comfortable just swimming in a lake by yourself? 
right, this open huge lake. And the likelihood of your answer being the first one being the choice is not because of, and there can be regularities, like for instance, wow, I'm feeling daring. But in a sense, you would feel more safe where more boundary and, and sort of clarity or clearness exists within the, um, the swimming pool. Whereas with the lake, you can't see beneath into what is existing there. And so psychologically, you don't map that terrain. And because you can't map that terrain, there is a sense of unnervingness, a sense of, well, what is there? And so you can explore that if you wish to, but as a natural default, the unexplored becomes something that's dark and, and, you know, we can become afraid of that. And so, you know, it's another way to see this natural psychological relationship between what we know and what we're comfortable exploring versus what we're not. And again, that's why meaning gives us a sense of security because we can um, soothe ourselves in the face of that darkness. And that's why spiritual transformation can be very profound, but also intensely scary. Okay. So a story of faith and meaning. Um, this is a very, this is an interesting kind of manifestation of um, the last 2000 years with uh, the Virgo Pisces axis, you know, not a coincidence that, um, one of the, the biggest things that's embedded within the psyche of, of our culture at the moment and the collective and the Pluto and Virgos is um, religion, right? And, and the nature of what religion has done and, and how it has brought people meaning and, and, and a sense of faith in their existence, but it has also been used in a way that has just pure darkness. And so it's manifested through you know, extreme violence and the, the necessity for using an ex, a pre-exist or an existing um, non-visible being to validate the behaviors and actions of, um, you know, psychopaths, as it were, to, 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 to kill many, many people, ideologies, as it were, example, um, things like, for instance, actually, I'll save that because I want to talk about the story. So, this is something really fascinating. Oh, and I love it so much. Sorry for that. Okay. So, um, the, the connection to the story is the relationship between the immature shadowness of the medieval cross and its journey from the mute, from its shadow to its, um, awakened state, the transformational path, as it were, right, of this this whole entire process. Okay, so here's this the the story of um, a nun who, at a very young age, had found a sense of um, connection to a deeper truth. So through spirituality, um, she entered into um, a church and where she announced herself as a nun and she followed the faith of this um this path she committed to the path and she she chose to to use that as the vessel for her devotion which is a key word here. okay and here's the archetypes that are and this is this is the point here why 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 talk about these things well these archetypes within the cross the na the natural zodiac they are like they're, they're, um, they're like the exosketching of and the, the fabric and the framework and the, the, the nature of, of how things become manifest in, in our reality. The archetypes set up the structure of this reality. So they're deeply embedded within our psyche and our relationship to the archetypes as human beings becomes one where we live out the expression of those archetypes. That's why the natal chart is such a profound tool for awakening your psyche because it reveals to you the, the complexity of your um, uh, story and the archetypes reflect that story to you. And so this is the kind of relationship that you, you're, you're having with your life and how they show up in the themes. And it's very different from astrology in a, in a kind of uh, um, like a magazine that gets written the com the, the columns and you're like, Oh, your sun signs this. And so this is going to happen. That's where astrology has become sort of repressed and distorted and kept away because of the very nature of what this story actually represents and the kind of mass 
uh, murders and destruction that have actually occurred in the name of faith. And this is the relationship that the Pluto and Virgos have to Pluto and Sagittarius. Okay. So here's this, this, uh, this lady, she recognizes the spirituality within her deeper meaning calling. And so she enrolls into, um, her, she wants to align her devotion into becoming a nun. And so she spends most of her time, um, you know, taking her idealism about the nature of her faith and um, bringing, uh, I wrote it down over here, the, the kind of intellect, right? So she, she takes intellect and she takes her idealism. So she has meaning in this Pisces and she takes her, her, her intellect and she learns, you know, she studies sciences and she, she explores different teaching methods and she uses her, um, her devotion, her, her path in life to, um, educate, this is another mutable cross, uh, people and, and children as an example. So she studies th throughout her, her life and she, she gets, you know, goes through educations and investigates stuff. And her meaning is that she's essentially being guided by an existential being. Okay. So there's a devotion to an existential force that is looking down on her saying, this is your story. This is, this is your, your path over here. And here's this devotion that I want you to follow through with. And so through this commitment to this devotion, this, and again, this existential extension of self that is guiding her to find meaning in her life. And so her meaning is found through this devotion. And, you know, she uses her intellect to learn and study. And then she, you know, through her summers, she educates kids and she set up some schools and she establishes the framework for education. Very, you know, mutable cross energy here. Taking language. Gemini, words, intellect, sharing that, that knowledge in a, in a very concise and structured way, Virgo, knowledge, Gemini. So to awaken or illuminate Pisces and give meaning to other people's lives. Beautiful. What's wrong with that, right? And so she does this for a long period of time for most of her life. And at some point, she becomes ill. Okay. But physically, in terms of this physical illness that, that grabs hold of her, and um, for a period of about two to three years, she is unable to heal it and nobody can heal this. And so naturally speaking with her inquiry and her necessity for commitment and, and you know, her purity to, to be true to the meaning of her devotion, because what else exists outside this idealization? And this is the purpose over here, right? The faith and the meaning and how it, how, in the beginning, we sewed it in together for the soul's unfolding and think about the, the necessity for faith as an ego structure and a security. But anything that's outside of that is very like the Grand Canyon. It's, it's just very daunting. It's overwhelming. The map of her psychological reality outside that scope is not there. And so it's fear, it's darkness. And it's right here consistently with all of us all the time. We're just interfacing with it all the time. That's why we have routines to keep that anxiety down from that, that thing, the uncertainty and the chaos. So anyway, she, she, she spends this time investigating and trying to figure out, and eventually she realizes that the doctors that are giving her the information, she's become more aware of what the doctors are able to understand. And, you know, she, she begins to get more ill and eventually gets to the point where she is now hospitalized. Right. And the, you know, this priest comes in, this is a, a pretty interesting comedy the priest comes in and he he sees her here and he kind of prepares himself to be able to communicate to her through this exorcist um, being and he uses the bible and again this is another projection of meaning into 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 his reality is using the guidance to communicate to her and she asks him the question you know what is the meaning of all of this what happens if there is no God? She's trying to reconcile with this. And this is a very, very profound thing because the mutable cross, you know, the Virgo parts, if doubt begins to keep kick in, which is the shadow of Virgo, it's doubt. And it's a necessity, you know, to question something. The shadow of questioning is doubt. And that little doubt creeps in. And we know that in faith, when doubt creeps in, especially within a religious context, the ability to handle the uncertainty of the darkness that exists here is too overwhelming. And so therefore it becomes an absolute 
Capricorn structure, it puts it in place and puts a boundary in place and says, you can't doubt your faith. This is why these things exist. And so here you have this, this, this priest that's about to do this and she's lying there and she's wrestling with this intense idea that how could a loving God or the devotion or the purpose of her existence be unfolded like this. And yet, yeah, she is sitting in this place and she can't make sense of it. It's like, there is no meaning to it. And wherever she tries to explore meaning, it just simply doesn't exist. It's like an existential void. And so she proposes this question to the priest and he runs out completely. He's just, you know, he runs out. He's like, he can't deal with that. And so just in that straight space over there, you can really feel the intensity of this experience, which I'm sure that we've all, at least at one point in our lives have come to where the nature of our meaning and our faith has been questioned because of an experience that has come to us where it was far greater for us to process on one level. And two, it challenged a reality of ours that was outside the idea of an existential investment into something. Okay. Cause again, we're investing in something existential. And so she she uh, she wrestles with this for a long period of time until eventually at one point she surrenders. And she, uh, she comes to realize that the peace in her comes through acceptance. You know, it, it's, it's, really, it's really weird because in the conversation that I'm sharing with you over here, that moment of acceptance that leads to peace, in that moment, that realization, that journey, you know, within the context of the whole entire story, that moment is pretty profound. And yet it's probably one of the most difficult things that we as human beings can do, at least from the ego perspective, because it means that we need to surrender the protection barrier that we have put in place that started off supporting this um, interface between the deep unknown and what we can make sense of it. And the surrender is this highest, it's kind of like the, 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 the highest principle of this mutable cross is the realization that we transcend or we start off creating existential ideologies and perspectives and meanings and we project it onto our reality to, to help us process the context of it. And we can find astrology as a means to do that. We can find numerology, we can find anything, any system. And we can place that illusion over it and we can be governed by that and possessed by it and we can be in a sense so caught up in its fantasy the mutable cross that we don't really see what's actually unfolding for us in the most purest sense and so the separation between and the, and the maturity between the shadowness of the mutable cross moving moving into the 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 trans like the, the transpersonal as it were is going from the separation this is the whole adam and eve story the separation the duality of our sense of self being just the self and that constant that constant dissolving until eventually we come to accept that the path of the soul has already been set in front of us and the nature and the experiences that we have are here to illuminate or awaken or remember help us remember um what the journey was about so the classic thing with um uh the, the second matrix film where neo asks the oracle you know why am I here? And she says, well, you know, you've already, you know, you've already made that decision to come here. Here you are. And why am I here? And, and that question says, well, you have to, you have to experience this. So those are not the words, but you've come to find out why your incarnation, your birth is the point, the natal chart of unfolding that will help you understand that. And so it becomes your whole life and your whole life is the constant investigation and interface between the meaning of each experience and the capacity to digest that experience. And as we nourish that, we start to sow the seed of our own personal truth. But we do have to fight with consistently the protection that we put in place in order to um, you know, deal with the enormity of the darkness or chaos or uncertainty that's just very much just on the corner over there. You know, it's you're about to the potential of it to arise at any moment is there. And so we're always wrestling with that consistently all the time and questioning it. So the, 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 the shadowness of that questioning and that, that wonder and the faith in the spirit 
in the most shadow form becomes an existential belief that we follow. And then eventually through many, many experiences of, of this surrender that this lady went through, this nun went through, she came into not only a crisis within her faith, Virgo, squared Sagittarius, but as the crisis took place, it opened up space for her to feel the oneness, which was the dissolving between the two barriers. So it's a reunion with the divine and it's, it's back to wholeness. And so the left and the right brain reflect these two, right? The hemisphere of abstractness and the, the, the hemisphere of logic. And when you kind of try to balance the two over there and you use the masculine and feminine principle or the, the Adam and Eve or the Lilith and the, the, the Lucifer, what you have is a, is a holistic brain chemistry which creates a connection straight to the Uranian field, which is insights that it illuminates then you to the totality of your infinite awareness. And that's where you see, you know, duality. And so the meaning in her existence was the realization of, in, in one sense, you could say that the meaning of this person's journey was to experience a crisis in faith that would bring her to know God at its most intimate level. And in that space of that most intimate level, the, the reunion would take place that's not possessed by an existential being. And so that was her destiny that started off with. That's what she felt. But of course, the journey from that point to the realization is the one that we go on. And that's obviously where we get tested and, and tried, etc. But ultimately, it's the reunion with the divine. It's very profound. It's very profound when you start to look at your reality through that lens and realize these things, um, because that's when you can stop um, breaking down the defense mechanisms and you can start seeing less of the victimization patterns in yourself and you can start empowering. And I think that that is actually the precursor to working with Pluto in my opinion. So and I just wanted to end off with this picture over here before I, you know, ask for some, or look at some questions, but, um, the mutable cross serves that purpose. And, you know, what's really interesting as well to me in this, in this experience, and I'll just kind of draw these over here. You know, there, there are, there are three things that brought me to this. One of the things is that in the world that we live in today, you can see that there's a massive polarization between um, sort of political agendas that are sitting on the left and political agendas that are sitting on the right. And both of them are, in my view, on one level, the manifestation of the, the attempt of the anima animus trying to be rebalanced uh, within this time. And it's one of the purposes of the Pluto and Libra generation, in my view, is to understand that polarity, which is why right now you're dealing with that such polarity in itself. Not a coincidence of Pluto and Capricorn. But you can see the extremes that are just manifesting themselves through um, the, the, the repercussions of a repressed feminine psyche in the, the anima and uh, the animus, the repressed masculine, and how those then are manifesting realities to the surface, and how those surface, how those realities on the surface, are encoded with the the um, mutable crosses structure, and the structure is different ideologies, different perspectives. So I'll give you an example. There's one guy that that I used to follow um, a, a while ago. And, but I still keep him on the feed because I'm, I'm intrigued to, to see, to always sort of like observe my psyche in relationship to his and to observe the different psychological patterns. And he had written a status on his, on his Facebook saying that, um, you know, YouTube is going to be doing uh, a certain closing down of channels and stuff like that. And, you know, expect to say goodbye to his channel. Um, but all he's trying to do is just trying to wake people up to the horrendous kind of manipulation of their, their, reality through the repression of this, that, and the next thing. And I was, you know, I was thinking to myself that this is a really fascinating thing because he genuinely believes that in his own subjective way, what he's exposed himself to is validating his beliefs. And because of the validation and what he's seeing in this age of information being consistently fed back to him, he is a prime example of how intensely dangerous it is right now to be caught up in your own ideology and possessed by a field of vision that may look to you as if it's the right path or the right thing or that it is validated but in actual fact is 
really just a reflection of your own psychological uh, predisposition to having the need for security in place and the sense of um, uh, survivability in place and then how that links with your values and how you perceive that to be the, the, the destiny or how you give that fate or destiny and it becomes that unfolding thing and you never know the truth because of the, 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 the illusion or the blindness to that. Um, and, and I think that the reason why I use that example, because of course I have to apply this to myself is that if, uh, if you explore different like fractals of people's ideologies and perspectives, and you ask the question, what is your personal relationship to why you hold that faith in place? You'll always find that there's a subconscious kind of pre-existing trauma or um, psychological complex, not all the time, but guaranteed there's going to be there that, that happened in childhood that then becomes a manifestation of why you support or view things the way that you do. Again, this is not a hundred percent the absolute truth, but it is definitely something that I've seen a lot. And you can have somebody that is deeply traumatized by oppressive totalitarian type of psychological experiences. And then so therefore as a natural result, rebalances itself to ideologies that not see that all structures in place are healthy to a certain degree and that they're not all totalitarian and that not everybody's after you. And then there's the other side in which there is so much chaos in your life that the necessity for overcompensating structures and rigidity are in place and that that is a necessity that must be used to guide people because everybody to a certain degree on some level is trying to find their way in this world at, at the moment. And so your ideologies and your faiths and your perspectives, you know, deeply entrench the perspective that you have. And it's something to really think about in terms of how you digest information. You've always got to be asking yourself the question back, you know, what is, what, what is it that inside of me that is fueling the perception that I have and why I use it to validate it. Why do I perceive it that way in search for truth? Um, I read a post by somebody yesterday, uh, uh, recognized astrology on YouTube that came to some of these conclusions about their own psychological predisposition. Um, and I, it was just, it was cool to read because I came to that conclusion myself as well. So I'll share my own personal story and then I'll open up to questions. Actually, I wanted to talk about the Pluto and Virgos. I hope I've got enough time. It's just about five minutes. Um, and that was the realization of uh, wanting to be a savior for uh, other people and believing so much in that sort of ideology. And I have Mars and Venus in a balsamic phase conjunction with each other. And I've got a lot of Sagittarius stuff. So that kind of belief system was entrenched. But when I began exploring the substructure of my own upbringing and the psychological state of my dad and all of that type of stuff, I was, it, it really, really opened me up to realize that how much of that conditioning field in my growing up days had shaped my, my, out, my outlook on reality to the point where I didn't even see that what was fueling the necessity for saving another person was the protection from dealing with my own pain. And when I realized that, I think it was two, a year and a half ago, and it was actually through an EA Zoom meeting that somebody was doing, and they were saying something about um, a process of therapeutic thing, and I was listening to it, and then it just hit me like that straight away of how much that had been encoded, embedded in my own psychological dynamics. Well, that just shifted everything for me completely, and that was even a point of um, one of the reasons why I felt that this was great. So I hope that that provides you with some value in terms of ex like us exposing your own philosophy to its illusions based on the protection mechanism that it's in there for. Okay. So that's, that's the conversation today. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, like I said, I just wanted to do, touch in on a, a little bit of the Pluto and Virgos if I have enough time, otherwise um, you know, another time. Okay. So uh, let me just press that over there and I think, okay, fantastic. Thanks very much, Linda. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you so much, Simon. Okay.